In late September 1942, our 13 weeks in Camp Elliott came to an end. We graduated as Navajo Code Talkers, Marine Corps MOS No. 642, and were promoted to Private First Class. We hoped to get some leave, but our officers talked to us. They explained that we were badly needed in the South Pacific theatre of the war, where the Japanese had already taken Guam, the Philippines, and Burma on the Malay Peninsula. They had attacked New Guinea and prevailed in the Battle of the Java Sea. The Bataan Death March in the Philippines, in which more than 5,000 Americans perished, had been well publicised back in April, around the time we had been recruited. The US victories at the Battle of the Coral Sea and the Hawaiian island of Midway were also known to us. Midway had been the first major Japanese naval defeat in 350 years, and of course we were familiar with the valiant ongoing struggle by the United States to take Guadalcanal. So again, we were not allowed to visit our families. We immediately prepared to board ships bound for the French islands of New Caledonia. It was autumn, before the middle of October. Our Japanese enemies, we were informed, had always managed to crack American communications codes. Past experience gave them a well-earned confidence that they could decipher any code devised by the United States. But they were unaware that a new era of wartime communications had begun. The ocean swelled and subsided, wave after wave, motion without end. I half stood, half leaned against the ship rail. One of my buddies leaned beside me. Our hands and faces clammy, neither of us spoke. That morning, most of the men had thrown up the anti seizic pills that were routinely handed out on board ship. Another code talker joined us and groaned. Are we there yet? En route to the French islands of New Caledonia, a group of islands off the east coast of Australia in the South Pacific, we travelled light. Our dress blues stayed back in San Diego, as did anything else we wouldn't need in battle. Some of the guys sent stuff home, but I just loaded a sea bag and left it at the base in San Diego. I never got any of its contents back, except for my dress blues. Our ship, the luxury ocean liner USS Lurline, had been converted for military use. The vessel, once ringing with the clink of crystal glasses, faint memories of haunting melodies drifting just beyond earshot, was now a military transport vessel. I could almost see the former passengers' moneyed men, like movie stars, resplendent in tuxedos, bejeweled women hanging on their arms. But now, in the fall of 1942, one big barracks area replaced the private rooms, and the separate dining areas had become a single mess hall. So we troops slept and ate together. The elegant vessel, armed with hastily mounted artillery on deck, moved toward a destination that had never graced its peacetime itinerary the Pacific Islands of World War II. When our transport ship docked in Hawaii the next day, only officers were granted shore leave. There were ten of us code talkers on board, and most were too sick to care about carousing on shore. We went below, where hammock-like beds were strung from a metal framework, four high, with racks for our rifles bolted onto the wall next to them. We climbed into our beds in the stuffy, hot hold of the ship. My bunk was on the third tier, and when the man above me climbed into his hammock, it hung down, burdened with his weight, nearly touching my nose. The smell in there of sweating bodies and vomit was terrible, but we could forget it for a while if only we could sleep. After a while I gave up and climbed out of my bunk. I went up on deck and slept in the fresh air, with a breeze rustling the leaves on shore and my blanket wrapped around me. We code talkers remained on board with the other enlisted marines, wondering whether we'd ever stop feeling seasick. We stayed in Hawaii a few days, always aboard ship. At this time, a new contingent of marine recruits boarded. The ship departed for New Caledonia, and the newly boarded recruits soon began to turn green. Like us, they had to develop their sea legs. The seasoned sailors assured us that we would all be fine by the time we reached our destination. I woke at 5am for breakfast, managing to eat a few bites. We practiced the new code all morning. At lunch, most of us were able to eat at least something. After a week, our bodies had begun to adjust to the constant rolling of the ship. After lunch, I did calisthenics with the other code talkers, the sick ones, joining in with the well. Then we cleaned our rifles and practiced close order drills. Finally, in late afternoon, we had some free time. 
Some of the men read, taking books from the ship library. I was never too much of a reader, although occasionally I'd pick up a book. That afternoon I joined a few of the others to play blackjack. Poker and blackjack were very popular. I didn't have much money and had no money to waste, so I didn't play cards all that often. It was a long trip to the South Pacific, a couple of weeks, and it was hot. The weather was one of the most difficult things we had to adapt to. Coming from the desert, we were used to heat, but we couldn't seem to get used to the constant humidity that transformed the ship into a sweat bath like the ones in our sweat huts back home. Those, though, we only stayed in for an hour or so. This muggy heat we couldn't escape. Often the men got together and sang. I always liked that. Someone grabbed a guitar and a couple of others played harmonicas. Sometimes we sang religious songs like Rock of Ages. Other times we sang popular songs. Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree and I've Got Sixpence were two of the favourites. Those songs always made me think of home. They reminded me of the beautiful land and the people I loved everything I was fighting for. We'd play rough and tumble, stealing one another's food and spraying each other with hoses on deck. Pretty frequently we'd get to watch a movie. Everyone looked forward to this. It was a great diversion from thinking about war. We needed that kind of thing. In addition to reminding us about the secrecy of the code, marine trainers had warned us to concentrate on our purpose communications and not to think about whether we'd live or die in the South Pacific. But those thoughts just came into my mind. I couldn't help it. It was impossible not to think. In general, we ten code talkers on the ship stayed close, talking Navajo and practicing always practicing the new code. Sometimes other marines in our battalion overheard our practice. What are you doing? they'd ask. We shrugged. Speaking Navajo, we'd answer. We were not allowed to reveal the details of our secret assignment even to our fellow marines. Cards, reading and the constant practicing of the code provided our most frequent distractions from the ordeal ahead. Unlike the meals during basic training, where food was a hearty and a welcome diversion, the food on board ship was not as plentiful as we would have liked. We did get two small bottles of sage beer every day, one at about 11 o'clock in the morning and one in the evening, and there was lots of coffee. But to augment our allotments of food, we code talkers volunteered for kitchen duty. We had to wake at four in the morning, but figured it was worth it. Some of the kettles in the galley were so big we'd walk right into them in order to scrub them. And we'd scrub the smaller pots and pans too. It wasn't bad work. While on kitchen duty, when not suffering from seasickness, we ate as much as we could hold our own meals plus leftovers. Grande Terre, the largest of the New Caledonia Islands, loomed as we approached. We gathered along the railing for a view of our next home. The ship slowed as the water grew more shallow and a small pilot boat came out to guide us in. The captain of the pilot boat came aboard the Lurline to help our ship captain navigate the unfamiliar harbour waters of Noumea Bay. As the ship drew into the American base there at Noumea, I imagined the feel of solid earth under my feet. Mountains ran the length of the island, dominating the scene before me, and conifer trees, a rare sight on a tropical island, lined the beach. They reminded me of the pinyon and juniper back home. I quickly squashed that thought. The challenging job at hand required my entire focus. I didn't need to be homesick for New Mexico. On shore, we ten code talkers from the USS Lurline reunited with others who had come on different vessels. It felt good to be together again. Through Marine Boot Camp, followed by the serious job of designing and memorising the code, we men had forged a real bond. Of the original 32 men who had worked together at Camp Elliott, including the three Ross Haskey, Felix Yazzie and Wilson Price, who'd been added to our ranks during the development of the code, 30 were sent to war in the fall and winter of 1942. We all served in the South Pacific. Only John Benali and John Manuelito were missing from the ranks of the fighting men. Those two had stayed in California to train new Navajo recruits in the secret code. It wasn't until later that they entered the war as combatants. On Grande Terre, we code talkers continued our combat training. We were warned early on not to stray from the base. Some of the French occupants of New Caledonia didn't like Marines, and there had been several instances of unfriendly confrontations with the inhabitants of the island. The French were our allies in Europe. 
Germany and Italy had declared war on the United States just a few days after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. I never quite understood the unfriendliness of the inhabitants of New Caledonia, but they definitely did not want us there. We Marines stuck together, working hard at our training, swimming, roughhousing, and occasionally sitting around a bonfire and telling stories or singing songs. We provided our own entertainment. Roy Begay and I, soaking wet, lay on the beach. We'd just practiced abandoning ship, a drill that we had to complete several times while on New Caledonia, just in case we'd forgotten all our practice back in San Diego. Our uniforms dried quickly, but later that night, again dripping wet, we crouched and slithered along the beach in the dark. It was our third night landing practice since our arrival on Grand Terre. We moved with stealth, avoiding the spotlights trained on the beach lights, simulating enemy surveillance. Next morning I woke early, unfastened my mosquito net and nudged Roy. Wake up, lazy bones. Roy groaned and turned toward me in the foxhole. Is that you, grandmother? We grabbed our mess kits, two sectioned plates that fit together with utensils inside and crawled out of the foxhole. All of us code talkers walked together to breakfast. The mess hall was located some distance from camp down the beach. I nodded at the man lined up ahead of me for food. He wrinkled his nose and pressed his mouth closed. Jeez, eggs from a can again? Another marine chuckled. Don't forget spam. Roy craned his neck to see the food. Those little hot dogs too. I'll admit it was a limited menu, but the food, big barrels of it, was for me one of the best parts of being in the Marines. It was good and it was plentiful, a real treat after boarding school. I know most enlisted men complained about Marine food, but I liked all of it. Spam was my favourite, and Vienna sausages were great too. So was the canned corned beef. I even liked the crackers. After eating, we dipped our mess kits in boiling water and returned to the beach encampment. In a half hour, the instructor arrived with that day's orders. Each day was similar to the one preceding, but the anticipation of battle hung heavy in the air, and we knew that this training was important. I concentrated. I intended to survive. That day we practised hand-to-hand combat. The steamy island, populated with tropical birds, snakes, fist-sized spiders, lizards, monkeys, mosquitoes, and flies as big as my thumbnail, was a different world from any I had ever experienced. After lunch, we attended classes, learning in depth about our waterproof radios. I, like most of the other Navajo men, had always lived in a home without electricity. But I memorised everything the instructor said about the electric crank radios, adding it to the store of knowledge I'd already gathered in basic training. I focused all of my energy, knowing that even though I was tired from last night's manoeuvres, this knowledge could save my life and the lives of other Marines. Physical and mental challenges were constant. Drill sergeants advised us that we'd face the same kind of challenges in battle. Only then our lives would be on the line. I slapped at a mosquito on my arm, then scratched a bite on my neck that had swollen to the size of a quarter. Whooping, I ran into the ocean fully clothed. Roy, Wilsey and Eugene followed. No mosquito would follow us there. We desert-bred men dunked and splashed each other, finding some relief from the heat. The water was warm, though, too warm to be really refreshing. It held that warmth even at night. When we staggered out onto the beach, our fatigues dried almost instantly in the mind-numbing heat. That night, crammed with Roy into a foxhole maybe three feet deep and four feet wide, I actually managed to sleep. I liked knowing Roy was there. Partnering with my roommate from Tuba City was good when everything else was so foreign. It was tough sleeping in a semi-sitting position, but both of us had grown up sleeping on desert ground, ground baked harder than the sands of New Caledonia. We woke up to a pleasant morning. The temperature was less wilting than it would be later in the day. Here on Grande Terre, no sounds of bombing or guns disturbed our sleep. We knew we'd better enjoy the silence while we could. By late October 1942, we felt ready. The code was indelible engraved into our brains. We had practised night landings and hand-to-hand combat. Thirteen of us code talkers from the new Caledonia training camp, me and Roy among them, received our orders. 
we would join the other members of the 1st Marine Division who were already invading Guadalcanal. I looked around at my buddies, noticed the sudden stiffness in their posture. Everyone was scared. The Japanese who held Guadalcanal were trained not to surrender. Their war strategy revolved around the Bushido Code, an ancient way of the warrior, first developed by the samurai. This code of conduct extolled loyalty and obedience. Soldiers were required to fight to the death and to take as many of their enemies with them as they could. Even facing impossible odds, Japanese soldiers chose to blow themselves up hoping to kill American soldiers in the process rather than surrender. They would die for the emperor. Their Shinto religion taught that this behavior was both expected and honorable. The Japanese believed that they, by divine right, should rule the world. Their societal structure was perfect, and all other nations should be subjugated to the empire of the rising sun. Their belief in Hako Ichiu, Japan's manifest destiny, taught them that all eight corners of the world would one day be under one roof, that is, the control of Japan's imperial and divine emperor. The Yamato race, the dominant race in Japan, had taken its name from the Yamato court in 4th century Japan. Sixteen centuries of history and culture had given the Yamatos a feeling of solidarity and entitlement. Their bloodline was pure, while according to their propaganda, that of many Americans had been mongrelized by crossbreeding. In the minds of the Japanese, Americans were weak, materialistic, and unwilling to die for their country. The people of the land of the rising sun convinced themselves that the Americans were subhuman. For a soldier of this pure race to return from war alive when his peers had been killed in battle was a disgrace. To drive this point home, it was not unusual for a Japanese commander to beat one of his own soldiers senseless. Soon the barbaric behaviour of the Japanese, whose wounded soldiers would try to kill allied corpsmen who came to their aid, made them seem less than human to the Americans. Americans did not share the Japanese desire to die. U.S. soldiers fought valiantly, but when the odds became impossible, they knew that capture was no dishonour. Some thought of it as preferable to death, while others, having observed the cruelty of our enemy, feared capture more than death. At any rate, there was no judgment rendered by United States troops against a man who was captured. Facing an enemy who thought so differently from the way we did was scary. Roy and I had made it to the beach alive, wading among floating bodies. We dug our first battle-time foxhole and now sat, soggy and scared, in that hole. The Japanese preferred to attack at night. We had been told that almost every night at midnight a single bomber flew over. Midnight Charlie, the island veterans called him, although there were undoubtedly many Charlies, each taking his turn at keeping US troops awake. Midnight Charlie flew slowly, his siren wailing and navigational lights blinking, making sure everyone knew he was there. Men on the islands would fire artillery at him, but he generally flew too high to be in range. Then he'd drop his bombs. If the enemy attacked that night, Roy and I had our equipment ready. Each of us had been issued three hand grenades, a small packet of bullets, dextrose and salt tablets, some sulphur pills and sulphur powder in case we got shot, a field dressing and K rations. We'd been instructed to take a sulphur pill and sprinkle sulphur powder over any open wounds if we got hit. The powder was supposed to keep the wound from getting infected. Popular word was that the powder felt cold on the skin, and it helped to alleviate pain. We all hoped that was true. Sulphur drugs were the precursors of penicillin. Ironically enough, one of our staples was a bar of felsnaphtha, the same brown soap we'd had our teeth brushed with in boarding school. We were expected to do our own laundry whenever we got a chance, using that lye soap. A waist-belted pouch held some of the necessities, specifically ammunition, and we wore a cartridge belt as well. We placed our mess kits in a top-opening haversack that we carried on our backs, and our canteens hung from a loop on the back of our belt. Our folding shovel was attached in an upright position to one side of the haversack. A bedroll coiled in an upside-down U around the top of the haversack, and a poncho was either slung around the bedroll or stuffed inside. In the wet foxhole, each of us had his ammunition pouch belted on and his haversack within easy reach. We could put our hands on anything we needed in the dark. In addition, we each had two mosquito nets, one for our head and another to cover our body. You awake? 
I whispered. Roy whispered back, Oh, what are you doing? About to check on my grenades, Roy said, thrusting one hand into his ammunition pouch. Yeah, I got mine. I felt for my hand grenades, encountering three spheres, furrowed like pineapples. For a moment I could almost feel I was back in boot camp, where I'd first hefted a grenade, heavy and deadly. I'm all squared away, I said, using the lingo we'd learned in boot camp. Roy tapped his rifle. I hope this thing fires okay wet. No way to keep it dry. I might have got some sand in it too. It'll fire, I said. No sand. You just cleaned it. Don't worry. You think I should zip it into that sack? Roy referred to the long leather sack that zipped open to accept a rifle. Although the sacks were designed to keep water and sand out of the rifles, we hadn't used them on Guadalcanal because we wanted our weapons to be easily accessible. None of us wanted to fumble with a zippered case when we needed our rifle now. What if the Banzai come? I asked him. Both of us had heard horror stories about the Japanese suicide attackers, whose name Banzai was shorthand for the phrase Tenno Heika Banzai, meaning may the emperor live 1,000 years. They struck on foot at night. When we heard them yelling, Banzai! Banzai! We knew we would witness a suicide unless they killed us first. The anticipation of either possibility was awful, demoralizing. If they come and your rifle is all zippered into that case. You're right, said Roy. I'll keep it out. I felt inside my ammo pouch. The packet of bullets was soaking wet, but they too would fire. Everything had to work, even underwater. Uncle Sam had planned for that. You think they gave us enough bullets? asked Roy. I shrugged. They must know how many. You think we'll use them all? My jaw tensed. I hope not. Shooting a man wouldn't be like shooting a coyote or a porcupine. The next morning before sunrise, Roy, still crouched in the foxhole on Guadalcanal, pulled out his medicine bag. I reached into my pants pocket and did the same. The soft, thumb-sized object, buckskin stitched into a cylindrical shape, gave me comfort. Designed to protect me, it had been made by my family and blessed by a medicine man. That medicine bag connected me to home, to the prayers of my relatives. It protected me and gave me confidence that I would survive. I rubbed the tiny black arrowhead attached by a wrap of rawhide to the outside of the bag. A white rock and several other small objects tucked inside had special meaning for me. The bag also held corn pollen, taken from the tassels of corn plants back home. Roy's medicine bag was different from mine, but they both had the same purpose, protection. No two medicine bags were identical because their contents were personal, but one ingredient was always the same bright yellow corn pollen. The other elements were specific to the person who owned the bag, perhaps a small piece of turquoise or other small mementos. No one talked about the contents of his medicine bag. Someone who disliked you could use their knowledge of the bag's components to cause you harm. Only people real close to you, like your children, should know about the contents of your medicine bag. There's a lot of power in those things. It's something you don't play with. Inside the medicine bag, my finger touched the pollen, a velvety smooth powder. It hadn't stayed dry, nothing had during the landing, but it was safe. Good. Keeping it in the heavy pocket of my pants had been the right move. I pinched some pollen, touching it to my tongue and the top of my head. Like the other Navajo men, I always knew which direction was east where the sun rises, where life begins. I gestured to the east, the south, the west and the north, completing my first morning blessing sitting in a wet hole in the South Pacific War. A white t-shirt hung on a branch, maybe twelve feet away from Roy's and my foxhole. Someone had tossed it there the night before. Other arriving marines had dug in farther down the tree line some ten or twenty, others thirty, forty and fifty feet away from Roy and me. During the night, the men all seemed to notice the shirt at different times. Was it a Jap? Shots, aimed at that shirt, rang out all night long. They zipped just over our heads. I tapped Roy's shoulder and gestured toward the shirt with a movement of my lips. Look. Ooh! Roy shook his head. The shirt flapped, a torn rag in the breeze. As dawn broke, someone pulled it from the branch, counting the twenty-one friendly fire bullet holes. 
Roy and I had made it safely through a night riddled with bullets. We'd slept very little, if at all, but the blessing helped to refresh us. We needed to be sharp. Today was the day we were going to start using the new code in battle. Some communications officers on Guadalcanal greeted us Navajos with scepticism. Yes, they'd been given notice about the arriving code talkers. And yes, the old shackle coding system was slow. Yet the notion of changing to something new during the heat of conflict filled battle-weary minds with doubt. My group of code talkers was assigned to just such a doubter, Lieutenant Hunt, signal officer under General Alexander Vandergrift. When we Navajos assigned to him had arrived, Hunt just shook his head. He knew of our mission, but he had never worked with a group of Indians, and he had faith in the old code. Also, he was one of the officers who hated the idea of switching tactics in the middle of a major military operation. He had decided to test the new code immediately, and had given us a message to send out on our first night. Directly after the transmission began, panicked calls came in. Hunt's other radio operators jammed our Navajo speech, thinking the Japanese had broken into their frequency. By then it was dark, and the annoyed Hunt postponed the test. That next morning, Lieutenant Hunt continued with the trial of the code. He ordered his radioman not to jam the transmissions, then told us code talkers to do our best. The test would determine whether or not he could use us. Both the code talkers and the standard communications men were given the same message, one Hunt estimated would take four hours to transmit and receive using the old shackle protocol. With the shackle method, a mechanical coding machine was used to encode a written message. The encoded message was then sent via voice. These encoded messages were a jumble of numbers and letters, and unlike the Navajo code, were meaningless to the person transmitting them. At the receiving end, a cipher was used to decode the message. The entire process was cumbersome and prone to error. While the men utilising the shackle code waited for the encoding machine to accomplish its work, one of our men, I think it was William McCabe, transmitted the message to another code talker. I can't remember who. The message that Hunt had estimated would take four hours by shackle took only two and a half minutes by Navajo code, an impossible feat by current standards. And the message was transmitted accurately, word for word. Lieutenant Hunt was impressed. But we Navajo code talkers already knew our code was good. None of us wanted it to go unused. With a code that could keep military plans and movements secret, our country would outmaneuver the Japanese. We were sure of it. Even after Hunt's test, American fighting men who overheard the Navajo messages continued to be alarmed, thinking the Japanese had broken into the US frequency. Communications men tried to jam the strange sounds. To identify ourselves as US troops and to keep our transmissions from being jammed, we code talkers needed a clear tag. We initiated our messages with the words New Mexico or Arizona. That was followed by the time and date spoken in Navajo. We finished off with the time and date again, then with either Ga, Neazja, the letters R and O, standing for Roger and out, or with simply Neazja for out. None of us liked to think about it but we had also planned a strategy in case we got captured. If the Japanese ever forced a code talker to send a message, he would alert the person on the receiving end by embedding the words do or die, in Navajo, of course, somewhere inside the message. When I looked around me at the other men, I could easily pick out the members of the 1st Marine Division who'd been fighting on the island for three months. They moved like zombies, their eyes focused straight ahead. None smiled or changed expression. They seemed not to notice us new guys or anything else. That first full day on Guadalcanal, after we passed Lieutenant Hunt's test, runners began arriving with messages. The runners, also called spotters, performed the dangerous assignment of scouting ahead of US lines into enemy territory and reporting back on the locations of Japanese troops and armaments. They delivered messages involving combat details to communication personnel, to the front lines, and to the rear echelon. It was a dangerous job, especially at night, when they could be mistaken for Banzai. It was a job originally assigned to us code talkers, one we had trained for, and occasionally we went out on a run, but generally we were too busy sending messages. Roy and I grabbed the radio. We both wore headsets. 
we moved to a position close to a Japanese nest of 80mm machine guns. A continuous barrage of shells from those Japanese guns wrought heavy damage on our US fighting men. A runner approached, handing me a message written in English. It was my first battlefield transmission in Navajo code. I'll never forget it. Roy pressed the transmit button on the radio, and I positioned my microphone to repeat the information in our code. I talked while Roy cranked. Later we would change positions. Bena ali tsosie akna as doni ato nishna ji go dadikad adil tahi. Enemy machine gun nest on your right flank. Destroy. Suddenly, just after my message was received, the Japanese guns exploded, destroyed by US artillery. I shouted, You see that? Sure did. Roy grinned, but didn't stop cranking the TBX radio he held. The radio, the size of a shoebox, weighed 30 pounds. It stored up electricity generated when the crank was turned. Both of us wore headphones so we could hear each other. Thin red and yellow cords attached the microphone and headsets to the radio. There was a button for transmitting and one for receiving. US artillery nailed them, I said. As I viewed this small victory a direct result of my transmission, the wet, the fear, the danger, all receded for a few seconds. Roy and I ran and crawled to a new position, knowing the Japanese were experts at targeting the locations from which messages had been sent. The enemy picked up US radio signals and delivered mortar shells to those locations. We never stayed on the radio a second longer than we had to, and the frequencies we used changed every day. Each day we were careful to dial in the new frequency on the TBX box. Immediately we focused on sending the next message, moving, then sending the next. Bullets zipping around us kept the level of noise high, but that didn't keep us from hearing incoming messages. Luckily both the headsets and our ears were good, and we heard the Navajo words in spite of the war exploding around us. Occasionally I looked over at Roy, who tirelessly carried and cranked the radio. He nodded, still cranking. After a couple of hours, we switched positions. I cranked and Roy spoke. My head reeled with Navajo and English words, with coordinates, with messages sent. It was good just to crank for a while, good not to worry about slipping, making a mistake that could cost lives. Artillery shells whistled past us. I dived, the radio under me. Roy lay flat out on the ground. We never stopped transmitting. More than 24 hours passed before we were able to grab a few hours of sleep. We woke, still exhausted, in the hole we'd dug two days before. I'm starving, said Roy. Snaking our way to the mess tent on all fours, we ducked bullets and artillery shells. At the mess, we grabbed some cold food for fuel, waved the omnipresent flies away as best we could, and ate ravenously. Not like the hot food in boot camp, I said. Heck no, that food was good, said Roy around a mouthful of cold spam. Yeah, well, I'm eating everything I can hold, I told him. You better do the same, no extra meat on those bones. I pointed at Roy's lanky frame with my thumb. Roy grinned. I weigh more than you do, I bet. I shoveled a forkful of cold eggs into my mouth and swallowed. Not too bad? We returned to relaying messages. My throat grew raw with talk. Never before had I spoken so many words without a break. I gestured to Roy. He handed me a half-full metal canteen that looked like an overblown whiskey flask. I drank, grabbed the TBX radio and started cranking. We tried to ignore cramped muscles, gnawing stomachs and the ordnance exploding around us. Warships crammed the once tranquil ocean along Guadalcanal's north shore. Bodies covered the beach. Then darkness moved in, thick with smoke masking the grisly products of war. Our messages relayed calls for ammunition, food and medical equipment back to the supply ships waiting offshore. Messages transmitted the locations of enemy troops to US artillerymen. Messages told of something unexpected that had happened in battle. Messages reported on our own troop movements. Messages forwarded casualty numbers, the Navajo code keeping the Japanese from learning of American losses in each foray. Throughout the days of battle to come, we sent those numbers back to our commanders on the ships each night. After being in operation for just 48 hours, our secret language was becoming indispensable. 
The hilly terrain on Guadalcanal posed real problems for the men operating mortars and artillery. Muzzle-loaded mortars were low-velocity, short-range weapons with a high trajectory, particularly well-suited to uneven terrain. A mortar could drop into an enemy trench that artillery fire flew right over. Shells fired by field artillery reached a higher velocity and followed a flatter trajectory. Howitzers were similar to mortars in function, but larger. The men firing all of these weapons dealt with a serious issue. Artillery, howitzers and mortars targeted an enemy who was frequently nose-to-nose -nose with the American soldiers at the front. Marksmen had to clear the hills and the heads of our own troops, causing them no injury, while drawing an accurate bead on the enemy. This became especially ticklish when we were walking fire in. That meant that our weapons were shooting behind the enemy and drawing them closer to the American troops at the front line. As they drew closer, we continued to fire behind them, moving both our fire and the Japanese troops closer and closer to our own troops. There was no room for error in a manoeuvre like that. The old shackle communication system took so long to encode and decode, and it was so frequently inaccurate that using it for the transmission of on-the-fly target coordinates was a perilous proposition. Frequently, in the midst of battle, instead of using the shackle code, the Marines had transmitted in English. They knew the transmissions were probably being monitored by the Japanese, so they salted the messages liberally with profanity, hoping to confuse the enemy. We code talkers changed all that. Roy and I travelled close to the mortars. And the mortars, due to their short range, placed us well within the enemy's line of fire. Not as close as the riflemen, who were always out front leading the attack, but still close. Sweat streamed down my back. I transmitted coordinates detailing the locations of Japanese and American troops. I knew men's lives depended upon the accuracy of each word. I wiped my brow with a sleeve, but never stopped talking. Out of the corner of one eye, I saw a flash of fire. Sand and shrapnel kicked up into the heavy grey sky. I kept talking. Just then, a spotter sent out to locate a pocket of Japanese soldiers and artillery returned. Someone handed a slip of paper to me, bearing the exact Japanese location. The same paper also reported the location of forward US troops. I squinted, rubbed my eyes, read the paper again. Any error could cause the death of my fellow fighting men. I'd sent hundreds of messages. Messages swam in my brain, jamming and tumbling over one another. I shook my head to clear it. I translated the data into Navajo code and spoke into the microphone that fit neatly into my fist like a baseball. I glanced in the direction my transmission would travel. Roy and I crouched so close to the American artillery and mortars that I could almost have shouted the information. I spoke clearly, carefully. I pictured the code talker who received my message translating it back into English for the gunnery men. I imagined those men planning a trajectory, one that would fire over the heads of the Americans and hit the Japanese. If a soldier was shot right beside us, we had been warned not to stop and help. Our transmissions could not be interrupted. That day, as the afternoon waned, communications slowed. Roy and I whispered in Navajo, joking with each other, trying to stay awake. Messages generally started coming in around 5am, so we woke up and plunged right into work. When things were busy, nothing else entered our minds, just the delivery of information. Lulls were more difficult than a steady stream of messages. Periods of quiet allowed exhaustion to creep into our brains like a work-worn dog, turn around three times and settle down, demanding sleep. We lay on our stomachs, on a relatively level stretch of land. Normally we tried to stay away from flat places because they afforded poor protection, but we had a clump of bushes for cover, and the enemy had been lobbing constant fire, hitting the ground only a dozen yards away, so we didn't dare run to a more protected place. I rested my Springfield Bolt Action 03 rifle next to my torso. I knew the hardware well, the smooth metal and wooden parts fitting together like the work of a fine craftsman. I had taken that rifle apart and put it back together blindfolded, in complete darkness. But the well-made weapon of World War I vintage was less important than my communications gear. I knew I would have to use that rifle, especially at night when the Banzai came. Yet even though we code-talkers had proven ourselves to be excellent marksmen in basic training, 
our responsibilities differed from those of other combat marines. Our primary job was to talk, not to shoot. The red light on the TBX radio blinked on. A small beep sounded, loud enough for Roy and me to hear, but not loud enough to alert the Japanese. A message. I pushed the receive button and we both listened. It was Roy's turn to talk, mine to crank. An explosion flared, not 300 feet away. It was a daisy cutter, the kind of bomb that threw shrapnel out sideways, exploding outward rather than up. A jagged piece of shrapnel dug a hole in the beach nearby, but Roy didn't seem to notice. I whispered to myself, damn Japs. Roy pressed the earphones to his head, obviously straining to hear the Navajo message. He nodded, translating the message in his head to English and writing it down. Artillery Lieutenant, Roy said, turning to me. I signalled a runner who grabbed the message. The Lieutenant, I said, raising my chin in the direction of a US tank bearing 90mm guns. The runner took off. A few minutes later, he was back with a response. Roy read the English note, and as all of us did, simultaneously translated it in his head to the Navajo code. He transmitted it. The Navajo code words were never written when we transmitted messages. That made us men living, walking code machines. And even if the enemy somehow managed to link our Navajo language to the new code, there was nothing written to help them learn the unfamiliar words. If the Navajo oral tradition had not been as strong as it was, human error could have rendered this method of communication impractical. But we code talkers called upon powers of concentration that had been developed by the constant exchange of unwritten information. As far as I know, we generally transmitted our messages flawlessly. If someone did make an error, someone else in the Navajo network would catch it and send an alert. And we never relaxed, never let up. I looked around and realised it was growing dark. Roy and I had been transmitting all day and would continue through the night and the next day with if we were lucky an hour or two to decompress before starting in again. I pulled a roll of tape from my cargo belt and bit a piece off with my teeth. I stuck the tape over the message light of the radio, masking the red light from Japanese eyes in the dark. You think we'd get more sleep on board ship? Roy asked. What? I chuckled. And miss all this fun? We men worked in pairs. Officially, two pairs of men who partnered together were coupled into a group of four, and two groups of four worked together with two rotators, bringing the total number in each band to ten. Generally, we ten sailed together on the same ship. When we reached an island, four of the code talkers in our band remained on board ship, and the other six disembarked. Our positions land versus ship changed with different campaigns. Once on shore, the land-based men stayed in touch with those on the ship and with each other, so everyone knew what was happening. I spent most of my time on shore, actively sending messages. And I, like the other code talkers, stayed in communication with all the talkers as much as possible, regardless of assigned groups. We'd report what was happening in battle around us. We'd let the rear echelon know when we needed reinforcements and give them the hot dope on whether a particular strategy was working. If someone screwed up and our men were targeted by friendly fire, we'd send a message through requesting a halt. That type of message was always heeded when sent by Navajo code, because the Navajo men receiving our messages knew the Japanese could not fake them. Our staying in touch had another advantage. If a man heard an error being made in a transmitted message, He'd click the transmit and receive buttons on his TBX radio several times. That click acted as a signal, telling the transmitter to recheck and retransmit his message. When messages were flying, it was difficult to tell where the click came from and to determine which message might contain an error. But we were fierce about deciphering any problems and correcting any misunderstandings. People make too much of how difficult the code was. We knew it like we knew our own names, so it wasn't difficult for us. But every man worried about making some sort of error. The strain of having to be perfect ate at us. It weighed upon us every minute of every day and every hour of every night. Every bit of information had to be accurate. Where the Japanese were, which way they were going to move, how many men they had. No one wanted any mistakes to get through and to endanger our own men. In addition, we had a battle liaison, a communications man, to whom we reported the day's events, especially during periods of fighting. 
Each morning, he attended strategy sessions and tried to prepare us for what to expect of the day ahead. The Marines cared well for us men and attempted to fully utilize our skills in gaining an advantage over the enemy. Despite my exhaustion and the danger on Guadalcanal, I was glad to work the land position rather than the sea. When there was a communications lull aboard ship, I knew the code talkers there were assigned other duties. They might be ordered to unload cargo or inventory the supplies. Their attention was diverted from the battle at hand. On the island, there was rarely a lull, and we concentrated on one crucial thing only, relaying the needs of troops in the midst of combat. A spotter arrived. He ducked down next to me to hand me a message. I now manned the microphone. Fighter pilots, he said. American planes were scheduled to drop bombs ahead of the American line. The message I held gave the coordinates of forward US troop locations on the island. Before we code talkers arrived, some of the pilots had dropped their bombs as soon as they reached the island, hitting US troops with friendly fire, then reversing course and flying back to their aircraft carrier. I'd heard how the brass got all over the pilots' butts when they almost bombed my first Marine division. Now we code talkers were utilised, relaying coordinates that would be forwarded to the pilots, making sure that the pilots knew the locations of their own troops. The runner took off, crouching low to avoid enemy fire. Exhausted, I took a sip of water from my canteen and translated the information into code. I relayed it to an aircraft carrier sitting offshore. As I finished, another runner arrived with another message to be sent. Roy reached into his shirt pocket and handed me a crushed packet of crackers. Here, eat something. You look like hell. As it grew darker, we moved in closer to a couple of marines who wielded a machine gun. Around nine at night, we heard footsteps. We made out a Japanese soldier running towards our position, waving a sword. He began screaming, Banzai! He ran straight up, his full height, not even crouching to try to protect himself. When he was maybe a hundred feet away, one of our guys opened fire. Several bullets hit the Banzai warrior, but he didn't drop. He took his sword with both hands and plunged it into his stomach. Then he dropped. A sacred death. It made me feel sick, seeing that, seeing how a Japanese would gut himself rather than be captured by the Americans. I thought about American men I had seen butchered by the Japanese, trying to feel like it was okay that the guy had stabbed himself. But it never felt okay. Seeing death come on either side was something I never forgot. Total madmen, the Banzai terrified US troops all through the war. Each Banzai was a one-man suicide mission, intent on getting himself killed while taking out as many enemy combatants as possible. The Banzai adhered to the Japanese doctrine of blind obedience to authority, even when it meant their own death. The suicidal Japanese always attacked the foxholes after dark and before dawn. The random nature of the attacks kept us marines awake in our foxholes, and if we managed to sleep, we knew we could wake with a Japanese sword slicing our throat. After a few minutes, when the Banzai didn't move, one of the non-Navajo marines dashed toward the body. He bent down and took the Japanese sword. Souvenir, he said, turning back toward us and scrambling back under cover in his foxhole. If the brass found him with that sword, they would confiscate it. It was against rules to take anything from an enemy's body. That particular prohibition wasn't needed for most Navajos. Our religion taught us that you didn't touch property belonging to the dead. However, there were some Navajos willing to risk touching the dead in order to acquire pieces of clothing or hair to be used back home in ceremonies. I wasn't one of them. Those dead Japanese were in no danger from me. I would have avoided the dead altogether if I could have. Things were quiet. I found it eerie how some days could feel almost normal, how men walked around almost as though we weren't engaged in war. It was morning, and I had managed a few hours of sleep the night before. Roy and I and a couple of the other code talkers sat among the endless thickets of palm trees and vines, eating military rations spam and corned beef out of a can and crackers. Just like Grandma makes, joked one of the men. At least there's plenty of it, I said, forking a large bite of spam. Yeah, Roy said, when we have time to eat. He stuffed a packet of crackers into his shirt pocket. A man held his nose as he chewed. Tough to eat with the smell of rotting bodies, ain't it? Someone said. 
I said, what's tough is knowing what that smell is. Roy glanced back toward the beach, although we could only smell it, not see it from where we ate. He had that faraway combat veteran look in his eyes. All those men, theirs and ours. The stifling smell of decaying bodies permeated the moist, hot air. Soldiers driving bulldozers tried to cover the bodies with sand when they could, but often they were thinly covered or totally exposed. A marine picked his way through the underbrush with his dog, a German shepherd, close by his side. Heads turned and we watched the pair pass by. Those dogs were impressive. They sneaked up on the Japanese, hunting them as a soldier would. When we came upon an enemy bunker, the dogs could tell by the smell whether it was empty or occupied. They also located snipers high up in the trees, and even at night they could sniff out hostiles. Their handlers would turn them loose, and they'd range back and forth across the area. Their tails stood up when they had found an enemy combatant, and their ears stood up at attention, their nose pointing. The dogs never attacked the Japanese, though. They were too valuable to be put at risk, which is kind of ironic when you think about all the men who were lost. The dogs were really smart, and it made me feel good knowing that one was on patrol while we ate. My feet were covered with blisters, huge things that were always growing larger, so full of fluid that they felt like they could explode. I took out my knife, my K-bar, and popped the blisters to relieve the pressure, then spread a butter-like substance provided by the corpsman over them. I stood and pulled my socks from the branch of a bush where I'd hung them to dry, then brushed sand from my bare feet. I tossed a second pair of socks to Roy. Here, dry. He sat down to pull on his boots, raising each and shaking it first to make sure a scorpion hadn't crawled inside. We'd been warned to dry our feet and socks whenever we could in order to avoid foot problems like toenail fungus. Any scratch could become an open sore, and sores festered in the tropical climate. Some of the men developed fungal infections and ringworm. Almost everyone got sores that ulcerated, festering like chickenpox. We called them jungle rot. They itched so much that you couldn't help scratching, and that made them worse. The corpsman gave us a salve to heal the sores, but we seemed to keep getting them. Dysentery, with extreme dehydration, was also a common complaint. So was typhus, which was caused by jungle insects. Corman handed out various pills to all of us. Used to these daily doses of medicine, Roy and I swallowed them dry. Malaria-carrying mosquitoes arrived like fleets of fighter planes, attacking in swarms, especially virulent at night. For that, we were given small, bitter yellow pills at a breen, and were administered various shots at least once every week or two. Hear that? I asked. What? said Roy. The bells, like the sheep. No sheep here? said one of the men. Another said, It's prayers. Someone back home is praying for us. I had noticed the bells before, usually around noon. Even thousands of miles from home, in conditions I could never have imagined, it was comforting. The sound of the sheep and goats coming in. Even though I had not been able to attend, my family had performed a protection ceremony for me, a blessing way, after basic training. I felt sure they continued to pray for me, and burned sage or chips of cedar, fanning the smoke over their bodies. Their prayers were carried across the miles as the pure, bright chime of the bells. The clear tones told me that I was still in good faith. In this place, with its constant fog, heat, and more than 100 inches of annual rain, I pictured the dry, sunny days, the crystalline clarity of New Mexico. Guadalcanal's mountains, their highest peaks as tall as 8,000 feet, reared up as a natural barrier between the northern and southern coasts of the 90-mile-long island. So there were no sweeping views like the ones at Grandma's place, unless you looked out at the ocean, and vegetation, much more dense than that of New Mexico, covered most of the flat areas of the South Pacific island. Clumps of kunai grass, taller than a man, with edges that cut like hacksaws, grew like lethal weapons in the high meadows. When we tramped through that grass, we crossed our arms over our chests, under our jacket or t-shirt. Still, I saw in my memory the oak trees and pinions of home, sitting in a soggy foxhole, wondering always where the Japanese were and whether they'd attack that day or worse. That night my fellow code talkers and I endured. During our first weeks entrenched on Guadalcanal, the war news was mixed. 
the Japanese and American navies traded victories, and after that, the battles shifted in favour of the United States. The slot shipping lane between Guadalcanal and the neighbouring Florida islands had become a supply corridor controlled by the Japanese. The task of resupplying their soldiers could only be accomplished by ship, since the United States controlled the single airfield on the island, and the Japanese were masters of naval battle. Soon, however, the Americans developed their own skill at sea. In mid-November 1942, the United States made up for the heavy losses they'd suffered in August, early in the Guadalcanal campaign, before we code talkers arrived. The three-day Battle of Guadalcanal, fought off Tassaferonga Point and Cape Esperance, resulted in the American Navy sinking 13 Japanese ships, two battleships, a heavy cruiser, three destroyers, and seven transports. That battle was fought in a portion of the slot that came to be nicknamed Iron Bottom Sound because of all the sunken ships that lined the ocean floor there. The United States damaged nine other enemy ships. Aircraft from Henderson Field destroyed another four Japanese transports. American losses came in at two light cruisers and seven destroyers, with nine other ships damaged. The United States was making a dent in the Japanese naval mastery of the South Pacific. On November 30th, Americans sank another Japanese destroyer near Tassaferonga while losing a cruiser and taking on heavy damage to three other cruisers. Despite the major damages that the US fleet had sustained, the Japanese Navy withdrew from Guadalcanal, taking with them troops and supplies that they had been unable to land. After that, the Allies gained confidence in their ability to rout the Japanese seagoing forces. Our enemies, who preferred transporting supplies in the dark of night, were unable to adequately resupply their troops on Guadalcanal. Meantime, the Marines on the island, and with them we code talkers, fought the more than 20,000 Japanese troops. After three weeks or so, even with the bombs and bullets flying, I began to feel at ease. I felt sure of myself. I knew what I was doing out there, just behind the front lines. Most of the Marines I was with knew we had a special job, using our own language. They treated us well. I never experienced any bad treatment. We all got along, and it was important, knowing that our buddies were there at all times, looking after us and us after them. In the throes of combat especially, everybody looked out for one another. We did our best to see that everyone was safe. Many Japanese soldiers fled to the chain of mountains that bisected Guadalcanal from west to east. These mountains dominated the land, leaving only a narrow coastal region on the east, south and west, with a wider strip of sea-level land to the north where the American troops had landed. Heavily forested Mount Austin, actually the summit of a group of steep ridges, provided shelter for many of the enemy, becoming a key Japanese stronghold. From Gifu Ridge, abutting Mount Austin to the southwest, the enemy could look out over Henderson Field. We Marines had to take Mount Austin, 